Joining us now, one of our favorite people, Stephen Yates. Steve Yates, as you know, you can find him on Twitter at Yates, D, at Yates Comms. I almost said DC Comms, at Yates Comms. And uh, he is also, uh, this is his wheelhouse. He served in the Bush administration. He advised former VP Dick Cheney on all this stuff. And uh, he's very much a conservative with America First Policy Institute and chair of China Policy Initiative. Okay, so Steve, always, as always, good to see you. I... I'm reading that Taiwanese officials are a little upset now upon learning about, because she took her son with her. And I, I understand that it's not unusual for people to take maybe a buddy with them. If they don't take a spouse, they might take someone with them. I understand that. However, this is a little different. And it kind of undercuts this strong, I'm going to be there for Taiwan image that she was projecting when she brings the second largest investor in a Chinese tech company with her, who happens to be her son. And now it's coming out that the Taiwanese officials are none too pleased about this. That seems like that's some damage. Yeah, well, you would think. Uh, if only there had been a national news story about <laughs> the offspring of a high-profile political leader who had engaged in questionable businesses, then, if only then, uh, Pelosi and other leaders of Congress would have had increased sensitivity about who they bring along and what those follow on conversations might be and what the appearance of all of that would be. But the shame of it all is that, of course, the, the New York Post was censored uh, before the election. And so, of course, no one knows anything about this kind of a risk. Uh, so all that sarcasm aside, uh, you know, it's a, it's a real shame that this is even a story for the sake of the Taiwan people who just want uh, some breathing space from an overbearing threat, yes. uh, a little bit of help from Uncle Sam, not necessarily to do things for them, but to help them do things for themselves and maybe help work with Japan so that maybe they don't have to stand alone or rely only on Uncle Sam in these circumstances. There's so much work to do and no one really needed any help to do it. Uh, and uh, the speaker had other members of her delegation coming along. Uh, so I mean, you're, you're correct that it's actually very common for members of Congress to bring a member of their family with them. Uh, you, you just think that there might be a rudimentary look at which member of the family might make some sense this time. Or what if I just get by with my policy advisors for, you know, what is supposed to be a government policy trip? So uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch about it that has a, a bad whiff. Uh, I don't know what this uh, young man is up to. Everyone looks younger to me with every passing day. Uh, but I mean, he's 53. Uh, he's like he's like Hunter Biden's age. But I don't know, Joe Biden. They, the way they talk about Hunter, he's like he's baby Hunter. So this is like baby Paul Jr. Away, you know, baby exactly. little infant Paul Jr. Exactly. So I mean, there's there's just no good way around it. But the real shame is uh, that leaders in Taiwan. Uh, in their system, they've got to go before their legislature and take questions, you know, sort of it, it's a hybrid between a presidential and a parliamentary process. And so a foreign minister and other people, a prime minister, they have to go before the legislature and take pot shots about, well, what happened and why was this person there? And all they wanted to say is, look, hey, we, we've got some support from the United States Congress at a time of need. And this is just an unnecessary pollution of what would have been a noble message. I mean, my jaw, we're talking with Steve Yates, my jaw dropped because I remember, you know, when she went in, they had buildings that said, welcome Speaker Pelosi in lights, yeah. in the buildings. Yeah. She had, I mean, you would have thought, you know, that it was, I, I, I mean, you, what, like, 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 what is it, BTS? Is that what they, the, one of the big bands, like one of the big boy bands out of, you know, like South Korea or something, or a J-pop <laughs> band, something, you know, you would have thought it would have, you know, like, like Blackpink or something. When she goes into Taiwan and there's like a herd of people there to meet her, they have signs, they're <laughs> cheering her and she's, you know, waving and they're so excited. And then she brings the second biggest investor in it. Oh, my gosh. And then I was reading several, not just one, but uh, actually a whole bunch of their politicians, including the former chair of the island's financial supervisory uh, supervisory commission, uh, Sang Ming Chung, demanded to know whether or not the island's ruling Democratic Progressive Party had a financial relationship with their family and whether her visit involved that. So we went from 
stand against China too. Wait a minute. Did you just bring your corruption uh, like to a whole another level here? I'm she doesn't have apparently the wherewithal to be embarrassed. I mean, my jaw, I legitimately my jaw dropped. Well, this essentially was bringing a pile of something in a brown paper bag, lighting it on fire and flying home and leaving it for the government there to put out the flames. Uh, and that's what happens for uh, the democratically elected leadership in Taiwan. I mean, they, they don't want to say anything negative about uh, the speaker or her visit or the United States. I mean, they, they have no margin for error. They need all, all parties in the United States, all friends from the United States to try to stand on one side right. against an overwhelming enemy that they face from Taiwan. Uh, and yet, uh, here's this uninvited complication. And yes, people in their political opposition are going to seize upon this. I th isn't that with a word that we use Counts. in American Counts. journalism these days? Of mm. someone is going to seize upon these kinds seize, of things or pounce, <laughs> freak out over. That's the pounce, other thing. Pounce was what I was looking for. <laughs> oh my gosh! It's just it just mars what could have been a and it complicates the her, the legacy that she wanted to leave. I think. I mean, Absolutely. she can't be too pleased about this, but it was her dumb decision to take her son. Uh, to go and do this in the first place. I want to switch gears to get into this story. The guy who had stabbed Salman Rushdie, we're talking with Steve Yates. Uh, the guy who stabbed Sal Salman Rushdie, it's been reported that he has, you know, surprise, surprise, a number of connections to the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps. And he had been here apparently for quite some time. He was described as, as being a Shiite extremist who looks like he had contact with this terrorist organization but i guess everybody was too busy paying attention to what was in melania trump's closet and watching parents at school board meetings to see this guy yeah no I mean, there's a there's a homeland security angle to this that is a little bit jaw-dropping but it's also a massive sobriety checkpoint for an administration that came in breathlessly seeking to revive terms of a deal with a theocratic regime that seems to have among the most active assassination lists of any government on the planet right now. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a number of Americans that are on that hit list. Uh, John Bolton I don't is even one of them, I think. That most Americans had paid any attention to John Bolton since he tried to sell his book, but apparently <laughs> they were still trying to kill the guy. Uh, and look at his uh, book sales, it's, guys. It's not worth it. Come on. <laughs> But it's you know, it, but it's it's a really important thing to remember that as Americans get lost in our own sort of pig pen slugfest, that there's real murderous, dangerous people out there, and we can't be making nuclear deals with them and giving them more pallets full of cash. Mm. We can't ignore these things because uh, we need allies to be able to stand up and contain these kinds of governments. Uh, you know, the uh, the our allies in the Gulf as imperfect as they may be, are the best bulwark to keep this kind of threat coming to our shores in the first place. But again, you can't have an open borders policy. You can't have a permissive refugee policy uh, and not have some kind of a problem like this pop up in our own country. Now, the rusty thing was not here, but it's the same lesson for the supposed postmodern world that thinks of, you know, one world, one government, no borders, all this other stuff. Mm. Uh, and it sort of does remind you that maybe not, we won't live long enough for this one degree of climate change if assassins from the theocrats of Iran can go out there and pop off anytime they like. Yeah, that's a very good point. We're talking with Steve Yates. Last last thing I need to ask you, obviously the raid that took place since the last time that we spoke and this it seems the the cert I was looking at the, the some of the details of the warrant. Uh, of course, you know, you can't really get too much into it. You can't understand probable cause, et cetera, without the affidavit. But in reading it, it seemed really like a very wide berth. Any records pertaining to Donald Trump's entire four years, you know, from 2017 to 2020. And it, it in the beginning, it seemed like they were focused on him potentially having classified documents. Well, according to the statutes that they're apparently exploring through Merrick Garland, it doesn't really matter. That's kind of irrelevant. It just looks like they're trying to get him on something. You've worked in previous administrations. You have extensive knowledge of this. How bizarre was this? Secondly, apparently they took his passports, too. That sounds unusual to me. And last, I thought, from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, 
aren't there a number of presidents that have had not not issues, but maybe little friendly squabbles with National Archives because archives want everything and the presidents are trying to put it in their their presidential museums? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a ton in this to unpack, the, but I would begin with the simple observation that my galaxy brain can't get it past the first point that the only thing we know is that we don't know the truth yeah. at this point. Everything else is academic. None of this really makes good sense. If an administration was serious about not appearing overly political, they did just about the worst possible job of that. Uh, and as someone who was cleared for a lot of the most sensitive materials, those kinds of things don't exactly have a long shelf life. Uh, for instance, when I left the White House, if someone had taken the drawers of the safe that I left behind in the office, but they somehow got that information, what they were most likely to discover is that the U.S. government employs way too many PhDs who write very lengthy analytical pieces that get fancy words stamped on the top of it, but would not lead them to anything operationally useful whatsoever. And even if the president had some kind of a cheat sheet about how to launch nuclear weapons, you know, we're often told that we should change our passwords every once in a while. Do you really think? that anyone can walk away with that kind of information and 18 months later, any of that will work, go ahead and give it a try. Give it a try, see what happens. Uh, and if it doesn't it result in an immediate visit by a SWAT team, then something has failed in the system. Yeah. But it's, you know, the, all, none of this makes any possible sense to me. Uh, you know, I, I go back to, you know, sort of my wheelhouse of US-China relations, Henry Kissinger did a lot of secret negotiation. Yeah. He and a lot of his staff took notes on what they were doing under this very expansive sort of documentary jihad that the, the pencil pit pushers are after. All those notes would have been covered by this. Yeah. And yet he walked away with a lot of notes that was after years of legal wrangling, he, he finally turned those things over, but there were no raids, there was no arrest. Uh, and arguably that had to do with the most important geostrategic bargains that uh, that Kissinger really without congressional oversight or even collaboration with the State Department was engaging in. That would have been very valuable during the Cold War. So again, if we were to take the premises seriously, none of this makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Now, can I say what their motive was? I don't read minds but I think your audience probably can reach a conclusion that I consider probably to be on track. Yeah, uh, definitely, we're like minds. That's interesting though about the Kissinger, they never rated Kissinger. And well, there was always Sandy Berger putting things in his socks and other parts <laughs> of his outer garments. And, Nobody will you know, see me do this, surely. They go after him. I, oh man, I remember that story too. And didn't Bill Clinton, from what I understand, what I've read, he lost nuclear codes, like twice, I think. Like one of them, one of the codes was in his suit. And, you know, no well, big, I'm just amazed. We are governed by Homer Simpson. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Steve Yates at Yates Comms on Twitter. Always so good to talk with you, my friend. Thank you so much for your generosity with your time. We appreciate it. Good to see you. Thank you, Dana. Mm -hmm. Take care. Take care.